very much for uh, your uh, participation here in the workshop. Uh, welcome to the workshop of uh, renewable energy, uh, integrating with energy matrix. We are working on to be doing the online transmission. I hope it works, right? Okay, so uh, thank you so much for for the uh, for having the speakers here, Professor Stefan, Professor Sajena Stefan, Professor Roberto Schaffer, uh, Rodrigo from EPE, from uh, Brazilian Energy Office, and Paula from ITA, uh, Instituto Tecnológico Aeronáutico. So we have uh, six presentations. Uh, we have 15 minutes for each presentation and five minutes for question and answers at the final of the presentation. So uh, we're going to start with Professor Stefan. Uh, he's an associate professor of energy system modeling at the Faculty of Technology, Delft University, policy and management. Uh, my, uh, his research focuses on understanding the technical, economic, environmental, and political trade-offs between different possible ways to build a 100% clean and renewable energy system. Thank you, Professor Stefan. Please. Ready to go? Okay, super. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thanks, Milat, for, for the invitation to this also. I'm going to talk about um, sustainable energy options and trade-offs. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. And um, the, the the problem in which we um, uh, we find ourselves is that um, we have. Sorry, maybe you can click next. Yeah, exactly. Uh, th these are global emissions in 2019, and as you can see here, the vast majority of these come from the energy sector. And of course, we want to mostly eliminate those emissions as quickly as possible. Ah, okay, I can use this. Yeah, right, oh, okay, so we clicked already. And as you can see, um, this turns out to potentially be mission impossible. Um, and my job is to figure out how to turn this mission impossible into maybe a mission uh, that is a little bit less impossible and maybe even possible. And what I wanna talk about first is some recent work we did on Europe. Um, I know we're not in Europe here, but unfortunately most of my work um, deals with Europe. So I'm gonna show you some results from um, a study we published last year. Um, and before I look at the results, I just wanna give you the context of how we um, came up with these results. So we built a sector coupled um, European energy system model. Sector coupled means that we have all energy using sectors um, so we have uh, building heat, uh, that's the main uh, source of um, energy used in buildings in Europe. We have electricity, so anything that already uses electricity today that you plug into a socket now. Uh, fuel demands um, as well, so that includes uh, industrial fuel demands and feedstock demands. Um, and transportation, um, especially road vehicles. Um, what we then do is we actually... Um, we disaggregate these demands spatially into 98 zones across the European continent. So some of the larger countries are resolved into multiple sub-country zones. We also model all of these demands as well as all of the possible energy supplies at an hourly basis. So we match demand and supply on an hour by hour basis. Here you see, for example, um, electricity demand and in blue which is relatively stable throughout the year and building heat demand in orange, which is very strong in the cold months uh, in the European winter. And finally, um, we have realistic representation of the electricity grid, um, as well as other uh, spatial aspects of the European energy system. So where there is high potential for wind and solar and so on, where we can actually place all these technologies in Europe. So all of that is added up into a very large mathematical optimization problem, uh, a linear optimization problem. And then we look for the least cost solution to supply um, energy to Europe uh, with some constraints, including complete elimina elimination of all fossil fuels. So we want a fully renewable system. So that's the basic setup. What we add on top of this is we say, okay, I'm looking for the cost optimal solution, that's nice. 
Uh, but in reality, there are many, many other um, aspects to this decision that cannot be properly represented just by costs. So we want to go a bit further and look for um, near optimal solutions. What does that mean? We start with the minimum cost solution. So our algorithm finds the minimum cost system. Then we say, okay, this, this looks like this. Maybe there's some wind farms spread around, some solar farms. Um, but let's say, okay, this, this decision space here on the x-axis, and that could mean anything. That's where we put uh, our technologies, what kind of technologies we place, how we deal with transportation, for example. Do we use hydrogen? Do we use electric vehicles? And so on. So all this is, is summarized in this decision space. And if we say that we're willing to move away from this minimum cost, this decision space really opens up. We get a lot more options for, for designing this system. And in this study said, we're happy to live with a 10% higher cost. We know that these costs are very uncertain anyway, and 10% above the minimum, that's still very realistic. That's still within the range of uncertainty anyway. So this opens up a whole range of other possibilities. And we have this spores algorithm which then looks for all of these other solutions and tries to look for solutions that are as different as possible to the cost optimal solution while staying within this 10% above the minimum cost. So this is one example of a solution. This is, in this study we created 440 different solutions. This is solution number 158. And it doesn't really matter exactly how this solution looks. Um, what you see here on the on the left-hand map is where the model places most of the electricity generation technologies. So wind in purple and solar electricity in yellow. And in the middle map, you see which parts of Europe are importing or exporting electricity um, in color. And you also see these yellow dots, which signify the main uh, sites of hydrogen production in the model and on the right you see where the model expands the existing electricity transmission grid and that is one of many different possible solutions but the key thing i want to highlight here and you also see that on the right is that europe is cut off um, from uh the, from from the outside world there's actually no um, energy going into or out um, of europe here so we're assuming that everything that's currently being imported fossil fuels primarily is replaced by uh, renewable um, production from within the European continent. And our models shows that that's possible. Sorry. Where should I stand? Here. Ah, okay. I see myself there. Yeah. Okay. That's, <laughs> I can even move a little bit further so everyone can see me properly. Okay. Um, right. So, but what our real interest here was to actually explore the trade-offs between different possible solutions. So we know that there's many different options to supply Europe with 100% um, with clean and renewable energy, but what are actually the trade-offs between them? To do that, we picked a couple of indicators um, that we thought might be relevant for people so making these decisions. And we, uh, we um, here you see storage discharge capacity. So that's the amount of storage capacity needed, electricity storage, batteries, hydrogen, and so on. Um, and you see all of our 440 different solutions here now. So 440 different um, options for Europe. Um, and we, uh, we score them between zero and one. So the solution with the least storage required is zero. The solution with the most storage required is one. And everything else is um, then um, normalized to within this range. And we can do that for a whole range of other different indicators. So the amount of curtailment of renewables, biofuel utilization, imports on average, um, how equally electricity and fuel production are spread throughout the continent, how much we have to use electric vehicles as a source of flexibility, and how much heat and transport are electrified. And what this now allows us to do is to say, OK, I might be worried about the amount of storage capacity needed. I might say I'm worried about the production of batteries because that requires rare earth uh, or, or, or critical raw materials. So I might want to look for solutions that don't require as much storage. And I can pick one specific solution here and I'll just mark that with an orange cross here and I'll call that the low use of storage solution. And then I can look at how this solution performs on all of the other metrics here. And in this case, this solution requires um, the maximum use of Europe's biofuel or bioenergy potential. 
And then I might say, okay, I'm a bit worried about that because there's land use implications. I might want to use that land for something else, for conservation. So let's look for another solution. And I can find one that has low use of biofuels. And this particular one has even lower use of storage. So that's great. And that comes with another trade-off though, in this case, a very high degree of heat electrification. Basically, if I say I don't want storage, I don't want biofuels, the trade-off I have to make is I have to electrify almost 100% of heat demand because that's then a source of flexibility and storage for the electricity system. So we can play around with these, uh, with, uh, these solutions. We can also look at what they mean spatially, this low biofuel and low storage solution. They both require roughly equal degree of transmission grid expansion, but I might want to look for another solution, yet another solution which has particularly low uh, requirements for grid expansion. So that's, that's the European context, um, and that's the sort of, um, I think that the main finding here is really there's an almost infinite um, degree of, of design flexibility to actually come up with a system like this. And I'm sure if we did the same study for Brazil, we would find very similar um, overall results that, that it's very much possible and that this design stage is huge, but I'm sure that the specific trade-offs would look very different for Brazil. So it would be interesting to repeat that. But because we're talking about hydrogen here, I also want to look a little bit closely, more closely now at the role of hydrogen. So I mentioned this before, our model um, actually um, decides where to put hydrogen production in Europe. And you can see in this particular solution, a lot of it is placed in, in the UK, in Spain, and in Italy. So partially fueled by uh, wind power, partially by solar power. Uh, wind power in the UK, solar power in the south where it's very sunny. And what does our model actually uh, use hydrogen for? We use it to make um, hydrocarbons, to make methane used in various processes and also as, as fuels. Uh, we use it directly in industry um, as well as for heavy transport, uh, heavy duty transport, shipping and aviation. And the model can make decisions about where exactly um, it uses hydrogen. Sometimes there are also options. Some things can be electrified or use hydrogen. Um, and indeed, this is kind of, um, if you look at also um, what other people say about hydrogen, this, these are sort of the main uses of hydrogen where there are also no real alternatives available, no real alternative technologies. Fertilizers, hydrogenation, hydrocracking, desulfurization, so industrial processes as well at the top here, as well as a lot of um, um, heavy duty transport, shipping, off-road vehicles, long haul aviation, and so on and so forth. Now, what we didn't look at in this study, in this original study, but we're looking at right now is the role of hydrogen imports into Europe. Thanks. Um, and this is very preliminary, so, so only sort of I'm only sketching this out here. Um, but what we find is that uh, although it's possible for Europe to, to self-supply um, its energy needs, including hydrogen, um, in this case, we looked at hy hydrogen imports from North Africa, so exploiting uh, the large solar potential in North Africa. Um, on the one hand, if you do that, you, need, uh, you, you end up with a much bigger hydrogen transport grid within Europe, but you gain the advantage that you need much less um, storage capacity um, for the energy system, both uh, power, so electricity storage, uh, but also hydrogen storage. And maybe more importantly, when we look at weather uncertainty. So we usually run these models with 10 years of historical weather data so that we have a range of historical weather conditions. Um, and, and you can see that if you have a very bad uh, weather year in Europe, you, to, to actually plan for that, you need to massively oversize um, your wind and solar farms and your hydrogen, um, basically your hydrogen systems or your electrolyzers. But if you allow for imports, you can use that as an insurance against this weather uncertainty. So you can reduce the size of infrastructure um, needed within the continent. So there is potentially a large role for imports. And of course, those imports may well come uh, from somewhere uh, like Brazil, where there's a very large uh, renewable resource as well. And so, and maybe an, a business opportunity. Um, and I mean, this isn't just me saying this. I know that also there are regular visits from, uh, uh, from Europe, to, to in, including to Brazil, uh, for example, from the port of Rotterdam, which is also a heavy user of, of hydrogen. 
Um, yeah, so these are actually my, my take-home messages uh, on, on, in terms of this, the modeling side. European energy supply without any fuel or electricity imports is possible. And not only is it possible, there's a very great, uh, a very great deal of uh, flexibility, a great diversity of options. Um, and, and only once we start to put in place specific preferences, like I want to avoid a specific technology or I, or I have a preference for less use of biofuels, that starts reducing this maneuvering space. But this really gives us a great degree of flexibility now to actually plan uh, this transition together with the people making these decisions. And hydrogen has definitely has roles to play. Um, and, and maybe green hydrogen imports are, are potentially attractive uh, leading to opportunities for regions with high renewable potential. Um, that's it. If you want to uh, find out more, actually, I, I put some links here. Um, also, maybe in particular, Calliope, that's the modeling software that we use for this, that we also develop in our group. Um, and it's completely free and open source. You can uh, find out more at that link um, there. Uh, that's it for now. Looking forward to questions and discussion. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so actually, uh, maybe maybe I wasn't one hundred percent accurate there. So we don't actually we don't assume there's hydrogen airplanes in this model. Uh, for all technology choices here, we've used only technologies that are available right now or are very close to market readiness. And so, in case of aviation, actually, we make the model makes synthetic fuels, um, or it can use biofuels. Although the potential there is limited, so hydrogen comes in indirectly. As, as the first uh, stage um, in, in various processes to make synthetic fuels. But, the, uh, but I think the key point is that it's all, uh, that there's no fossil resources that are allowed anymore. So any fuels must come from essentially hydrogen or, uh, or, 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 or a bio resource. And, and so maybe the time horizon, we don't make a specific statement, this is 2050 or, or 60 or 55, but that sort of rough uh, range. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question, and that's a very uh, 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 severe weakness of this study, um, or, or what, what we've done here, because we simply sort of look at the end state, this beautiful world that will somehow come into existence 50 years from now. And so here we don't look at the, the sequence of events or decisions to actually get there. Um, there is work on that, and this, we're also looking at that next, actually, how... If you have this very broad decision space or, or, or just almost infinite possibilities uh, to build the system, this very deep uncertainty, how do you make decisions now? What should you do first? Where are the kind of no regrets, this investment decisions and so on? But right now, this is completely uh, <laughs> left out of the picture here.
Okay, next speaker, I would like to invite Professor uh, Roberto Schaffer from the Energy Planning Department here at COPI. He's a full professor of the Energy Planning Program, uh, extensive academic, academic background, but I just put here a brief uh, description. Works in the area of integrated assessment models for mitigating climate change. He uh, collaborates with the gover uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, of the United Nations since 1998. Okay. <clears throat> Is this one? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Stefan. I think my presentation goes very much in line with what you have just presented. So I think it's going to be an interesting discussion here. Basically, what I'm going to be showing here, let's say, is some future scenarios we have been building for Brazil. And just to answer your question, let's say, we have been running this model up to 2060 in five-year steps. So exactly your question, you're going to see here how the energy system in Brazil will evolve over time. And I'm going, going to try to zoom in a little bit on, on, on offshore wind and also green hydrogen uh, uh, in this study. Okay. What's an integrated assessment model? Very briefly, <clears throat> is a model that normally starts from, let's say, a kind of economic storyline goes up to, normally, these storylines go up to 2,100. And basically, based on that storyline, on how the economy is going to evolve, how different countries are going to evolve over time, then we can see what kind of energy system, but not only energy system, uh, the land use system as well, because we're going to be talking about biofuels here, for example, or the competition between biofuels and food, how the material sector will evolve, as Professor Stefan mentioned, let's say, if you talk about electric vehicles, you have to think about lithium, you have to think about cobalt and things like that. So we have to think everything at the same time. And also, uh, even if we're gonna run, and we run our model in a least cost kind of approach as well, we have to look into other, let's say, dimensions that you want to look at. For example, issue of biodiversity, energy security. So there are many dimensions here that we try to uh, input into our model. Uh, not gonna go into details here, it's a very sophisticated kind of uh, modeling we have been doing here because we have, let's say, two global integrated assessment models, the T and the coffee model. And why I need uh, global models here? Basically, if I only optimize the energy system in Brazil, and eventually if my model chooses to use more ethanol, and I decide to export uh, gasoline, I need to know who is gonna buy gasoline from Brazil. Or if for some reason, I, my model chooses to electrify light duty vehicles, and I want to export, let's say, biofuels. If I'm electrifying my fleet, what else other countries are doing? That's why normally what we do here, we run our global model, which splits the world in 18 different regions, where Brazil is one of these regions. And by doing that, I can see international trade of any good and services between countries. And then I use the result of the Brazil inside the global model as the boundary condition uh, to run my national model. Okay, not gonna go, gonna go into details here, but these models that we have been developing during the past four years, for, of past 20 years here in Brazil, in our group, uh, uh, now are being used as one of the four marker models by the IPCC, uh, the most recent report launched uh, last year. So, but I'm going to focus more here on the BLUES model, which is an integrated assessment model we have developed for Brazil. We have roughly some 50,000 technologies represented in that model. So it covers the entire energy system, the land use system, uh, materials, et cetera, et cetera. But just to, instead of going into the model, but just to explore some scenarios here, I'm going to explore three different scenarios. This is a base on a work we just finished this year. Uh, and then I'm going to explore the first scenario, which is I call Brazilian transition, which is a scenario that builds on the Brazilian NDC. NDC is the national determined contribution all countries that signed the Paris Agreement in 2015, they have compromised to, let's say, uh, have uh, 
commitments uh, to meet climate targets. And the Brazilian commitment is basically to reach climate neutrality by 2050, meaning that greenhouse gas emissions need to go to net zero by 2050. So I'm going to explore how the energy system in Brazil will look like if you need to go down to zero by 2050. In the case of Brazil, this is quite a challenge uh, because why in the world some 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy sector, in Brazil, only one third of those emissions come from the energy sector. Two thirds come from the land use sector. So being net zero GAG, greenhouse gas emission, means that you have to have strong negative emissions in terms of CO2 to compensate for methane and nitrogen emissions from the ag agricultural sector in Brazil, which today is more than 50% of the Brazilian GDP. So being net zero GAG means to be very negative in CO2 by 2050, meaning being net zero CO2 by 2040, which is quite a challenge. Okay, this is one scenario. Second scenario is what I call an alternative uh, transition, is a scenario where we are not going for the least cost solution, but where we force some technological options. W what? For example, uh, hydrogen in the Northeast based on some negotiations that are going on to export hydrogen from Brazil. Or where we follow a wrong decision of Brazil to try to build one more nuclear power plant. Or a decision, let's say, uh, to use ammonia in shipping. Things that are, the model does, does not choose, but that we're forcing in that model. Or, electrification of light-duty vehicles in Brazil, which is not the least cost option for the country, but because the auto industry is international, if for some reason Volkswagen, Toyota, Honda have decided to stop producing uh, internal combustion engine by 2030-35, it's not a solution for Brazil to say that biofuels is the best solution if the cars are not going to be av available. So basically, we are forcing him, not a least cost solution, but eventually something that's going to happen. And finally, the third scenario, which is not that different from the first one, is a scenario where we see what would be the contribution of Brazil in a 1.5 degree warmer world. So basically, we are forcing the world to meet the Paris Agreement, reaching 2100, no more than 1.5 degree warmer, and then we see what should be the role of Brazil in that 1.5 degree world. Okay, these are the scenarios. I'm not going to go into too much details here because it would be too much. Uh, it's, not, it's not moving. It's moving here, but not here. Funny. It's too much there, yeah. Okay. Okay. Next. Okay, no, one before. Okay, that's fine. Okay, not gonna go into details here, but basically uh, we see that depending upon which scenario we talk about, we have somehow a different profile of uh, the energy system in Brazil. And what's interesting here is that we see in this alternative transition, because some decisions are being made to force some technologies, we have much more biomass being chosen by our model. It's not because we want biomass, it's because we need the negative emissions that biomass would allow for us. Again, we're forcing the model to meet a target, and then the model tries to find a way to have negative emissions to compensate for positive emissions that are coming out of other sectors because of that decision. Next, please. Uh, you can, okay, just show what I mentioned before. This is, let's say, where greenhouse gas emissions come in the case of the world, 76% from the energy sector, in the case of Brazil, only 31%. So when you talk about the energy system Brazil or climate mitigation Brazil, we're not talking about energy only. We're talking about much more or something else than the energy sector. Next, please. And just to mention here, as I mentioned, let's say, if you look at the, the, what Brazil has, let's say, pledged in Paris, we have pledged to be net zero GAG by 2000, uh, uh, 2050. Uh, I think this, there's something wrong here, but the important thing here is not exactly that. The important, uh, oh yeah, exactly. Uh, 
basically see that there is a, a delay between CO2 and GAG because you need to be CO2 net zero before GAG, net boost. Uh, power generation. Here you see what would be the profile of the energy system in Brazil, depending which scenario you're talking about. So, for example, the only scenario where we see wind really becoming very important in Brazil is in this alternative scenario. Why? Because it's a scenario where we are forcing that the auto, let's say, the, the transportation sector will be as electric as the International Energy Agency is seeing the future of the world after 2030. So if we force our transportation sector to be electric, as the world is expected to be electric, we're going to need much more wind to, let's say, to be able to provide the electricity to, to, to that specific sector. Otherwise, let's say, uh, wind is continue to increase in importance, but it's not going to be as dramatic as uh, in the alternative sector. Next one, please. Uh, in the case of oil, we can jump. Let's we focus here, not oil, biofuels. The case of biofuels, the same thing here. Let's say we see, let's say, a different profile of biofuels depending upon, let's say, what scenario we are having here. The reason why we have this different profile in the alternative sector is precisely because we are forcing, let's say, ammonia, we are forcing hydrogen, we are forcing some kind of, let's say, alternative fuels. And in the case of Brazil, the most interesting option for producing uh, advanced biofuels is, as you said, is precisely uh, coming from hydrogen, which can be green or not, but basically this is the way we do it. Next, please. Uh, hydrogen. I decided to give a zoom here in the case of hydrogen. When you look at the different, let's say, scenarios, again, we see, let's say, uh, hydrogen uh, becoming more important over time, but basically not hydrogens for direct consumption. We're talking about basic, lots of hydrogen embedded in synthetic fuels as a way to produce those fuels. Again, we don't see direct consumption of hydrogen hydrogen, except, again, in this alternative scenario, because you are forcing to have hydrogen, because you are forcing Brazil to export hydrogen, which is not the least cost solution uh, for our model. Next, please. Here, sorry, that's in Portuguese. Basically, I'm showing here that in most scenarios, what we have is production of hydrogen for indirect use and not production of hydrogen for uh, direct use. And here we see some exports of hydrogen uh, from electrolysis only in this alternative scenario. Again, the least cost solution for Brazil is not to export hydrogen. But if you force that, of course, the model will choose to do that. Next, please. Uh, OK, here, the same thing, let's say production and and direct use of hydrogen. And then here we see, let's say, how this is uh, split uh, in the different scenarios, where this hydrogen comes from. So we see that, let's say, we see hydrogen from electrolysis, from biomass, so many sources for hydrogen uh, production in Brazil. Next, please. OK, in the case of transport, uh, again, let's say, is, a, is an interesting situation here, because in this net zero GHG by 2050, or a Brazil in compliance with the Paris Agreement, we see, let's say, uh, the importance of green diesel, green gasoline, green kerosene for aviation, biodiesel, ethanol, electricity. So it's an interesting mix here that we're going to have in the future in the transport sector. Next, please. Uh, in the case of industry, uh, yeah, you can jump that, please. Next one. OK, my final comment here, and just gonna, uh, general comment here. Basically, what we see in our scenarios is that offshore wind and hydrogen is not a least cost solution for Brazil. Let's say our model chooses a lot of wind, but onshore wind, because it's much, much cheaper. So based in the case of Brazil, and it's for sure in the case of Europe, only if you impose restrictions on onshore wind that the model decides to go offshore, which is okay, no problem, but it's important to, to note that offshore is not a discourse solution. Same thing about hydrogen, let's say. Hydrogen is, a not, is not a least cost solution for the energy system in Brazil. Why? Because we have biofuels as a much more interesting option for shipping. But this is an important point here, let's say. When I mentioned in my question, Professor Stefan, uh, 
typically a let's say a, a, a ship uh, has a useful life for let's say 30 35 eventually 40 years the average age of the shipping fleet in the world today is below 15 years so most ships are going to be let's say traveling for the next 20 years so you need to find let's say drop in fuels for the existing shipping infrastructure and for the existing airplane only biofuels can do that or only synthetic biofuels. You cannot use hydrogen, you cannot use ammonia today in the existing fleet. And because our scenarios here go up to 2050 or 2006, which is something that's no more than 20, 20 something years uh, ahead of time, basically you have to think about energy solutions that would meet those uh, targets. And also in the case of Brazil, as I mentioned before, if you agree that Brazil will comply with its Paris, let's say, uh, pledges, which is to be net zero GHG by 2050, it has to be net zero CO2 by 2040. So it's, this is something that needs to happen in the next 17 years. Any, any truck that is sold today will be on the road for the next 20 or 25 years. So you have to think about negative emissions to compensate for a diesel truck that's being sold today or for a diesel truck or diesel bus that's being sold today. And that's why, again, I don't, I don't want to sound negative here, but in the case of Brazil, the EU, real issue in the energy system or in the yeah, energy, energy system is not the energy system. It's the land use part of the equation. It's deforestation, afforestation, afforestation, uh, in pasture improvements so that you can have negative emissions to compensate those positive emissions from the so-called hard to abate sectors, which in the case of Brazil is very much associated with agriculture, because Brazil is a major exporter of agriculture products, including meat, where you have methane and N2O associated with that. That's why the energy sector in Brazil, it's not that electrification is not a solution for the transportation sector in Brazil. Eventually, biofuels is. Why? Because it's not enough to have net zero CO2 in the transportation sector. You have to have negative emissions to compensate for the positive parts of the Brazilian economy. So it's a completely different reality in the case of Brazil than in the rest of the world. Okay, thank you very much. The, the, least cost, the least cost solution for negative emissions as well is carbon capture and storage in the biofuels industry. Why? Because, let's say, in the fermentation process, when you produce ethanol, you could produce an almost pure stream of CO2, 95%, 98% CO2. So, in our case, basically, we use that negative emission. That's why our model chooses biofuels, not because we want biofuels, because we want to negative emissions. And in that case, because our model has inside a, a, a materials uh, module, then we reduce to produce lots of petrochemicals and bioplastics from biofuels. Precisely, we have the important use of that. So, so then the least cost pathway for fuel is also the most desirable one. Yes. Okay. Yes, but then we have to put a good constraint on, for example, biodiversity. And that's why, let's say, Okay, uh, Roberto, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question has to do with your 
with offshore wind. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the developments now in terms of turbines uh, are related to offshore wind and the, the, the size and the power. And they are not uh, feasible onshore because of the size. How you see this uh, case? You, you mean that uh, the competitive is onshore, but the future seems to be not so easy onshore. forbid the construction of new onshore wind in Brazil. And then that case, we have not, oh, no option. You have to go offshore. But from a least cost solution, our model after 2050 never chooses offshore wind. Just wait for the answer because okay. the only way that okay. everyone can <laughs> listen to us is by microphone. Hi, Professor. Um, just to understand, you said something about the current model. You were verifying um, compensating the positive emissions. And um, right now we know that Brazil is currently trying to explore even more oil wells. So um, I would just would like to understand if you are talking only about the southeast and northeast or if you are taking... Uh, and accountability, the north and the oils there is yet to be exploring. Thank you. This is a, this is an excellent uh, question. I'm gonna. I will try to be very brief. In fact, let's say uh, perhaps we have the most detailed integrated ascent you can find in any country in the world because we map all oil reserves by quality, by cost, by vol volume. So our models, the global one and the national, are extremely detailed. So what happened, and which may be a, a, a contradiction or may look like a contradiction, that even in a net zero CO2 or net zero GAG Brazil by 2050 or 2040, oil production Brazil continues to grow. Why that? Because of the oil we produce today, it's a light to medium oil. It's sweet, so low sulfur, con sulfur content. Uh, the carbon footprint is extremely low. The average carbon footprint of a barrel of oil today in the world is 22 kilograms per barrel. In Brazil, it's 8 kilograms per barrel. Uh, the most resilient, let's say, demand of oil products is uh, jet fuel which requires exactly the quality of oil we produce in Brazil today. Having said that, that's why when we look at what would be the demand for oil up to 2050 in the world for petrochemicals, for jet fuel, for shipping, basically we see the Brazilian oil replacing very low quality oils you have today. Uh, Canadian oil, which is very is terrible from oil sands. Uh, Venezuelan oil is very bad. Some oils in, let's say, in, in the Middle East. So, just to explain to you, so basically, you see over time, if today oil consumption in the world is in around 100 million barrels per day, 
by 2050, that demand will go down to 20 or 30 million barrels. But still there's going to be some demand for flying, shipping, petrochemicals. And basically, the oil Brazil will exactly use, occupy that space in a least cost solution for the globe, which doesn't mean that, for example, California, you opt for a least cost solution because then you have, let's say, issues of just transition. And so it's very complicated. That's why one thing is what the model says is the least cost solution to solve a problem. The different thing is, let's say, what's going to happen. So, but this is just to end here. It's interesting that in the case of Brazil, because of the peculiarities of our oil, we can have our industry producing more oil for exports, not for domestic demand, but our export mostly for non-energy uses, for petrochemicals and also for aviation. Thank you so much, Professor. Let's move to the next presentation. <laughs> Move to the next presentation. I'm gonna do the next presentation. My name is Milad Shadman. I'm a professor here at Ocean Engineering Department, and uh, I would like just briefly to show about some possibilities in Brazil and some research that we are doing. And uh, yeah. So talking about the offshore renewable energies, what are the sources and how they can actually uh, be uh, used in this energy transition scenarios, talking about the uh, potential in Brazil, opportunities in Brazil, and a little bit about the green hydrogen from offshore wind. Uh, we did a really preliminary uh, assessment of the potential of hydrogen in Brazil, just to share with you today. Okay, when we have a look at the, okay, it's back. Oh, it's going back. The energy transition scenario, uh, actually reported by the IRENA. Uh, we can see the, uh, uh, the, actually, the electrical matrix in 2050, and we can see the participation of the offshore renewables like the, the small part, the, the upper of the, the, up, the, the top of the, actually this, this, the column of 2050 is the offshore renewables, about the 4% of the actual energy metrics. And we have the wind, the 35%, that is, it's uh, the projections show that the half of this wind gonna be offshore wind. But uh, let's say, <laughs> this, is the, this is the objective to actually uh, keep the global warming uh, below the 1.5, actually, uh, degree. Okay, when we talk about the offshore renewables, we can divide the sources into two categories. We have ocean renewable energy, or we call marine energy or marine renewable energy, that our sources originated from the seawater. So wave energy, ocean current, tidal current, tidal amplitude, thermal gradient, and salinity gradient. And we have the other sources that are available on the sea space that are not originated from seawater, they are offshore wind and solar energy. Basically, there are resources that we are working in our group. Okay, just two, two green ones are the sources that already commercialized around the world. And the waves and tidal current technologies are the technologies in a pre-commercial phase of development. So we need some more, more, a little bit more time just to be, to have a product which is electricity to be competitive with other sources in the energy market. Okay, briefly about the technologies. There are more than thousands of patterns and different concepts about the technologies, but you can see here the first uh, image left one is the a wave energy converter when you, we have when you have two actually moving body and you have a relative movement between two body and you can take advantage this uh, this kinetic energy just to produce electricity when we talk about the current energy converters basically the concepts are similar to offshore wind to, to onshore and offshore wind uh, where you have a hydrocinetic turbines just take advantage of the currents to produce electricity 
Then we have the Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, OTIC, which is the system that basically work uh, with a ranking cycle. You have the superior layer of the water uh, warmer and you have the inferior layers uh, uh, cold. So you can take the warm water just to evaporate the uh, working fluid and you have the vapor to drive the turbine and consequently producing electricity. Then you can condensate this uh, vapor using the cold water from the deep, uh, from the deep actually water. And uh, then you actually continue the cycle and you're producing electricity. This is the closed cycle. You have open cycle, hybrid cycle. You can produce desalinated water. And of course, about the offshore wind that different uh, actually platforms depends on the water depth that we have. We can use uh, fixed structures and up to 60 meters normally and from 60 meters to deeper waters, normally a floating structure are being used. Okay, talking about the, uh, the potential of these resources here in Brazil, we did a study in 2019 using uh, global uh, models just to see the potential of three principal sources, the ocean thermal gradient, wave energy, and ocean current. As we can see here in OTEC, we, have, we can see a, a red region here that represents a, a very good potential of OTEC because normally to be technically viable uh, operation, we need a thermal difference of 20 degree. So we can see, we start from here, south of Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, we have during almost all the year, we have this 20 degree of, of difference. So it seems, it, it shows that this is the really constant uh, uh, availability, let, let's say. So it, it can uh, actually result in a higher capacity factor when we talk about the production of electricity. Wave energy, we actually observed a really good wave resources along the all, all the Brazilian coast and about the ocean current, we only uh, observed the good ocean current with the high velocity in the north and north, north is, north is and north of Brazil. Normally this good current energy happened in a distance of two, 200 kilometers from the coast. Uh, but nowadays we have uh, technologies that can work with the lower velocity of current energy. So uh, other regions of the Brazil, like South East, can be interesting uh, for, for, this, for this kind of uh, source of energy. So we have here 20, 20 uh, units of 10 megawatt OTEC plants. It means that 10% 10 of, 10 of the residential electricity consumption of the North if, uh, so. This is just just have an idea about the about the about the potential of the OTEC here in North Seas. Okay, about the offshore offshore wind. Actually, we had different uh, publications, but I choose to I choose to put the EPA roadmap here. Uh, we can see that we have three hot spots along the Brazilian coastline in term in terms of the offshore wind in northeast Rio Grande do Norte. Ceará, Piauí, and Maranhão, these uh, states that has a really good wind potential with high capacity factor that can reach up to uh, 80, 85 percent, depends on the this depends on the season, and it's the general. It's like a average of between 50, 60, 65 percent of capacity factor. The same thing we have uh, here in southeast. Here, uh, really good. Uh, wind here, but uh, normally far from the far from the shore, it's, it has a, it represents a good opportunity for oil and gas decarbonization, as we have uh, most of the oil and gas offshore oil and gas activities in Brazil here in southeast and the south as well. Uh, Rio Grande do Sul and Santa Catarina are two states that represent a really good offshore wind. So in terms of Numbers we can see uh, here uh, the potential of 620 and uh, 1.3 terawatts. Uh, there are two different uh, numbers here. It is because that there are two different models. 
and sometimes different considerations for uh, uh, available space and, and, and actually uh, uh, usable space at sea. Yeah, this is this 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 numbers show the uh, usable space that we have here for for this study and for this study that you can see this is bigger than this one, so it results in a higher number. But it's normal when we talk about the actually uh, resource assessments of different renewables. So different studies, different assumptions, and different numbers. Uh, this is another two studies that we did, especially uh, uh, focusing on the southwest of Brazil. So we can see very good resource here in south between 200 meters and 2,000 meters of water depth. And uh, actually, in terms of levelized cost of energy, you can observe here the green area, the region of Cabo Frio, north of Brazil, no, north of uh, Rio de Janeiro, something between 100 and 150 uh, dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, this is a really good, really good win in this region. Actually, there are challenges involved, so we need floating structures to be able to actually capture more energy in this region. But however, as I said, this show a really good synergy between oil and gas activities that we have here in this region. I think it has a delay. Okay. When we talk about the technical environmental restrictions, it means that, okay, you have the economical uh, exclusive zone, but you cannot take advantage of all the area that you have. So you, it involves different technical and environmental restrictions. So you cannot put your wind farm anywhere that you want, just based on the higher wind velocity that you have. So uh, this is the study that we used the different data from different ministries, basically uh, uh, energy ministry and environment ministry, that these colorful areas show the um, biological importance of the area. So the red one is a high biological importance. The orange one, the, uh, the red one is very high and high and normal. Anyway, so uh, as we can see where we have good wind energy resources, we actually have a sens sensitive environmental area. So it doesn't mean that we cannot put our wind farms there, but it, it needs a really uh, 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 specific, let's say, monitoring before actually studying about the, uh, 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 putting a wind farm in such areas. And we can see here in this region, as I said, th these are the oil and gas activities in the Persal area that we have. So uh, we can see evidently a synergy between the wind, offshore wind, and the oil and gas activities here. Another possibility that we have, we have lots of oil and gas platforms need to be decommissioned. Decommissioning involved really uh, severe environmental impacts and the high costs. So this is another, another opportunity that we have in Brazil that's uh, actually using the platforms that need to be decommissioned for, for the hub of energy or for the pilot for offshore wind, uh, current energy or wave energy. Actually, we did a, a preliminary economic and te te technical study of possibility of some, some, some platforms in Northeast, in Potiguá campus in Northeast of Brazil. And uh, now I'm going to talk, uh, just to uh, finish my presentation, about the a project that we are working on, uh, about the offshore hydrogen from offshore wind. Actually, there are different, different ways and methods to produce hydrogen, but I'm talking about the, uh, this method, this renewable energy, water splitting, electrolysis. So in this sense, we have... Uh, a project with total energies. We work in a multidisciplinary way, working in the uh, with meteorology department, electrical department, uh, mechanical energy planning, and other departments, just to uh, can be captured and analyze different aspects of the 
of the of the project. Basically, we have two scenarios when we are working. Uh, we have offshore wind. There are fixed structures. So we have onshore production of hydrogen. It means that you produce electricity offshore. You transmit the electricity to the coast, to the shore, and you do, you produce hydrogen onshore. Or the offshore production of hydrogen, it means that you produce electricity offshore, produce hydrogen offshore, and you transport the hydrogen by pipe to the onshore. Of course, there are other possibilities like, uh, like storage the hydrogen here by the ship and just export that, but Anyway, this is this is another possibilities that we are we, we will consider in the future. This is basically the scenarios that we have in our project, and uh, this project involved the actually development of a algorithm that consider the a coupled time domain uh, power control and electrolyzer model. So it is it is really important to see how to distribute the power you produce power. You need to distribute it between electrolyzer, the desalinator, compressor system, and any other stuff. And put and storage in the batteries for conditions that you have a low wind. So you need you need the, to administrate this power. You need to control this power, and you have the electrolyzer involved. Different, as you can see, it's difficult to see, but different components and involved that we call uh, uh, plant balance. So. Uh, all this dynamic, and of course, we have the offshore wind, and we use uh, uh, an algorithm to optimize the offshore wind layout as well. So this is the this is the real time project. This is the real time model. In each time interval, we have this process using wake velocity for an optimized offshore wind from layout, time domain power control, including all loads and batteries, pitch control of wind turbine. That's the control of the blades of each wind turbine for controlling the power. We have the pain electrolysis system, including water level, temperature, and pressure control, electrolyzer and battery recharging control strategies, real-time coupled power control electrolyzer model that was simulated in MATLAB. And this is an important one. So we deliver, actually, we produce hydrogen with only 70 bar because this is the really challenging issue. It's if you want to, uh, storage with the 400 and 500 bars or 7, 70 or 30. So it depends. So depend the, the different power consumption. It's going to affect the whole process and the cost of the process. So we are working with 70 bar of hydrogen. Okay, just just to just to finalize, <laughs> how much time that do we have? 50. Okay. Uh, so just uh, only two slides to finish. Uh, th th this is actually this is our approach that I that I show here. We different we apply different restrictions here just to calculate our usable areas, right? So the colorful area that you can see are usable areas that we consider that are uh, uh, they are possible to use for offshore wind production. Of course. We have other restriction we can we can include just to just to reducing this usable area. But this is what we have for this study. So based on this usable area, we have number of turbines here. We have regions here, and we have the different category of the uh, bathymetry or water depth. And so. If we use the 15 megawatt wind turbine, we have this total installed capacity with different bathymetries, right? Based on this total installed capacity and considering a capacity factor of 50% kind of average for all the coastline of Brazil and using that algorithm that I showed to you, based on that algorithm, uh, we have this potential for hydrogen production. It, this is only a, a, a theoretical potential. It doesn't mean that the Brazil can really produce this hydrogen. This is only to show that what is the theoretical potential that we have. Of course, when you want to, in fact, really in, in, in practice, you want to uh, take advantage, it's going to be a, a, like a part, a small part of this potential. But this is really big number. Just to have an idea, the Repower EU 
plant target for 2030, it's 20 million tons based on the hydrogen, European Hydrogen Bank. And they said that 10 millions can be produced in Europe and 10 millions need to be imported. So uh, this is the numbers that we have. This is the preliminary approach, preliminary study, but the numbers are really big. And uh, just final remarks that uh, what I said, great potential of offshore renewable in Brazil that we can observe. Environmental issues need to be addressed. However, the off offshore renewable energy synergy with oil and gas activities as an opportunity for decarbonization in the, along the Brazilian coast and south and north. Great potential for renewable hydrogen from offshore wind. Specifically, we have really high velocity of wind and with high capacity factor, constant wind. This actually uh, help to reduce the levelized cost of hydrogen. And actually resource complementarity, uh, which result in a relatively lower levelized cost of hydrogen that we can see along the coastline. Okay, this is what, what I had to present. Thank you for, for the attention. <laughs> if you have any question. Obrigado pela apresentação, Milaje. É, gostaria de pegar algumas, alguns pontos do que o professor Schaeffer colocou né, sobre a competitividade de fonte, é, que mostrou né, realmente é, as eólicas offshore são mais caras e talvez o fator de capacidade né, maior ainda não consiga torná-la competitiva. Né? Mas se fazendo algumas considerações é, prévias, né, é, se a gente voltar para o Proinfa, a eólica onshore ainda também era pouco competitiva, né? então a gente precisou um pouquinho de, de subsídio e hoje ela já está já andando com, com as próprias pernas. Né? E a gente sabe também que é, o fator de aprendizado e o fator de escala né, de, de projetos, quanto mais né, vai reduzindo o custo, é, possa se tornar, né, ela, ela pode se tornar competitiva no, em, em breve. Né? Então, como que você vê assim, essa avalanche de projetos que que a gente está vendo aqui no Brasil, né? já tem 74 projetos em 182 é, gigawatts de, de potência, né? praticamente o dobro. Então, acho que essa avalanche de projetos pode ajudar na competitividade. O que, que eles estão vendo, né, esses empreendedores aqui no Brasil, que, é, que possa baixar esse, o CAPEX e o OPEX? Obrigado, Rodrigo, acho que basicamente o que você, o que você falou, né? É, quando a gente fala sobre eólica offshore, né? Tem algumas vantagens com relação ao eólica offshore. O professor Sergente também falou, né? Que a gente consegue em cada unidade, colocar uma unidade de, hoje em dia está falando de 20 mega, mas 15 mega já é, já é uma coisa comercial que está sendo produzida. Essa é uma vantagem. Você consegue colocar mais turbinas no mar, né? É, e turbinas maiores, onde na terra é difícil para transportar né, esses componentes para os lugares. E a proximidade do fonte de energia com o centro de consumo também é outro fator interessante. Né? Se a gente considerar a perda na linha de transmissão, eu estava vendo um relatório em 2013, a perda de transmissão só no, no, no Brasil é equivalente de consumo do, do estado do Paraná. Né? Então, se a gente conseguir produzir perto do centro de consumo, também é outra vantagem né, que a eólica offshore pode trazer. E questão de, eu diria, é, descarbonização de óleo e gás, né, que está sendo muito olhado aqui, né, sendo muito investigado. E é, é, questão, quando a gente fala sobre um sistema monopile ou flutuante, especificamente nas águas intermediárias, de 50 metros até 100 metros, né? onde a solução flutuante, como semi-submersível, poderia ser interessante, porque é, envolve menos questões ambientais em termos de instalação. Né? O monopile, você tem que colocar o um monopile e, e, e penetra no solo de 30, 35 metros. Estou falando sobre turbina de 7 mega. Então, se tiver 15 mega, talvez uma coisa mais né, robusta. E na hora de descomissionamento, envolve questão muito ambiental e custo alto. Então, eu diria que é, eólicas flutuantes, não necessariamente para ultra profunda, né? também é um, um, uma pesquisa que a gente está trabalhando no nosso grupo, claro, 
mas é, nessas águas intermediárias também seria interessante, só para finalizar que a Europa começou 20 anos atrás, 25 anos atrás, turminas bem pequenas, e hoje em dia, né, é, Inglaterra produz, acho que é 7, 10% da consumo de energia eólica offshore, né, enfim, eu acho que é por aí, tá bom? Ok, uh, thank you so much. Let's let's move to the next uh, speaker. Rodrigo, please. Uh, he's an energy research analyst at the Energy Study and Environments of the Brazilian Energy Office, uh, working on the mapping of the energy resource and long-term integrated models. And he's a PhD student in the Energy Planning Department here at COP. Thank you. Bom dia, pessoal. É, vou falar em português para conseguir dar tempo aqui, que eu tenho alguns slides, senão não, não bato minha meta. Sorry, Stefan. So, any question, feel free to, to ask. I try to, to answer. Bom, pessoal, é, vamos falar sobre algumas rotas de produção de hidrogênio no Brasil. É, e as por que está que sendo tão falado ultimamente? Né? Assim, já é, o hidrogênio já é usado há bastante tempo aqui no Brasil, já tiveram alguns projetos, alguns programas, a gente vai ver aqui mais para frente também. É, mas como o professor, é, os professores já colocaram aqui também, assim, ele também faz parte de um programa, faz parte de, de NDCs, é, principalmente para descarbonização de setores de difícil eletrificação. Então ele está dentro de um contexto global, e, e a guerra também, ela, ela alavancou um pouco, então agora está numa hype, né, o hidrogênio. Então a gente vai falar um pouquinho das rotas de, de produção é, do hidrogênio. Vou falar um pouquinho da IPEA. A IPEA é uma empresa pública, ela é o braço é, técnico do Ministério de Minas e Energia, a gente não trabalha... A gente, não é, a gente não tem uma função de agência, mas a gente trabalha também em parceria com a, tanto a ANEEL e a ANP, que são as agências regulatora, reguladoras de eletricidade e petróleo. É, a gente tem 300 funcionários aqui no Brasil, né, aqui no, é, no Rio de Janeiro. E alguns produtos que, que a gente é, produz, assim, um balanço energético nacional, é o Atlas de Eficiência Energética, o Plano Decenal de Expansão de Energia, Plano Nacional de Energia, Plano de Longo Prazo. É, temos dashboards, temos dados abertos também, é, webmap. Então, os dados georreferenciados públicos. Pode passar uma melhor Em relação ao hidrogênio, a gente tem algumas é, publicações já. Temos as bases da Consolidação de Estratégia Brasileira do Hidrogênio. O hidrogênio cinza, a gente vai falar, detalhar um pouquinho mais as rotas de produção. É, o hidrogênio azul, o hidrogênio turquesa. É, e, recentemente, também a gente está tá participando do Programa Nacional de, é, do Hidrogênio. Deixa eu passar. Como comentei, assim, já está já na terceira onda do hidrogênio. A primeira foi para o... Quer dizer, uma das, dos primeiros publicados pelo governo, né, não só do EPE, mas o PROCAC em 2002. É, bases da economia de hidrogênio, do MCTIC em 2005. MCTIC em 2010 também, é hidrogênio energético. Da IPE, a gente já, em 2020, a gente lançou é, o PNE 2050, a gente escreveu um capítulo específico de hidrogênio. O PDE, que é o Plano Decenal de Expansão de Energia 2031, a gente também pegou um, um capítulo inteiro para hidrogênio, cal, com cálculo de potencial. É, tiveram duas resoluções do CNPE, que é o Conselho Nacional de Política Energética, que é, que sugere né, é, é, que o hidrogênio ele entre na, na pauta e ele favorece também assim, programas de P&D, tanto a NP quanto da, da ANEEL. Então, já temos alguns programas né, de, de P&D, já temos algumas é, startups também, que já saíram desses programas de P&D. A Hytro é um exemplo, é um exemplo é, clássico, é, uma empresa brasileira, foi comprada também, e hoje ela é uma das maiores do mundo. Pode passar. 
No PNE 2050, a gente é, criou esse capítulo, né, que são tecnologias disruptivas, mas ele ganhou também um, um momento muito grande de hidrogênio, então ele, o capítulo cresceu no PDE. No, no PDE 2031, então a gente aprofundou um pouco mais o estudo. Pode passar? Como, que, como eu comentei também, o Programa Nacional de Hidrogênio está é, sendo coordenado pelo Ministério. Ele tem basicamente três, é, três eixos principais, políticas públicas, tecnologia e mercado. E a gente trabalha com... E daí são as câmaras técnicas específicas. Né? Então, é fortalecimento das bases tecnológicas, é, capacitação e recursos é, humanos. É, o terceiro eixo, planejamento energético. É, arcabouço legal e regulatório. É, crescimento de mercado e competitividade. Cooperação internacional. Passar? Então, indo agora para as rotas né, de produção. Aí. Bom, a gente... É, comumente fala assim, em jargões de mercado, a gente fala é, rota cinza, rota azul, rota verde, né, que é hidrogênio verde, que é de eletrólise, mas são é, terminologias é, de mercado assim, que favorecem um pouco a compreensão, mas não são é, muito precisas. Então, a gente tem, assim, atualmente a gente tem uma abordagem agora que é a intensidade de carbono, não exatamente as rotas tecnológicas, que elas, elas podem ter algumas imprecisões, de denominações, mas eu vou falar assim só é, dentro de um contexto que a gente já está tá acostumado a ver de mercado. É o hidrogênio preto, né? É basicamente o a gasificação do carvão é do, do antracito, que também aqui no Brasil não, não é comum. Da marrom é do carvão mineral, que é da ulha, também é gasificação. O hidrogênio cinza é o principal, é o mais comum, que é a reforma do, do metano, reforma a vapor do metano. Basicamente, 70% do hidrogênio hoje é, é por essa rota. A rota azul também é reforma a vapor do, do metano, porém tem a captura e uso do carbono. O hidrogênio verde, já comentaram aqui, lá dispôs muito bem também, eletrólise. O hidrogênio branco, também assim na, na Austrália, o pessoal fala hidrogênio dourado, mas é o hidrogênio geológico, ele ainda está pouco estudado no, é, no mundo. Já tem alguma coisa comercial lá em Mali, também na Austrália, mas está é, tá bem incipiente esses estudos, mas é uma oportunidade boa. É, o turquesa, que é pirólise também, no, é, sem gerar CO2. O hidrogênio musgo é reforma, é, também vem do, de, é, da biomassa, então de resíduos, né? então, reformas cat, é, catalíticas, gasificação ou até do próprio biometano, da reforma a vapor do biometano. Então, uma rota parecida com a cinza, só que ela vem de renovável. E o rosa, que seria da energia nuclear, que também produz eletrólise, quer dizer, por eletrólise. É, a Angra também é um exemplo disso. Né? Assim, a Angra já produz. Então, nos processos de... A Angra tem, assim, ela tem a captação de, de água do mar para refrigerar os seus, é, seus processos. E, e na captação de água tem muitas incrustações. Então, eles já geram hidrogênio, só que para só da cloro. Então, o hidrogênio é um subproduto. Então, ele acaba sendo ventado na, na atmosfera, mas não é, uma, não é comercialmente aproveitado. Mas é uma, uma possibilidade também. Cara, mas é. Basicamente, as eficiências do, é, das rotas. Né? Então, você vê a, a principal rota é gás natural, em torno de 70, mas se a gente vê a eletrólise, ela não está também tão atrás ali, né? Pode passar? Alguns custos típicos, né? A gente vê assim, realmente, ainda a reforma é a vapor do metano, a principal rota, e vai continuar sendo. Temos alguns usos também, já foi colocado, assim, fertilizante, amônia, uso bastante intensivo para o refino, para o metanol e metalurgia. Então, aqui a gente tem algumas grandes possibilidades de aplicação além da energia. Só em relação a custos, a gente vê ainda que a solar, isso aqui é, também é mundo, né? Como né, o fator de capacidade nos países da Europa é mais baixo, e aqui é considerado off-grid, então ela, ela varia bastante. E olha que também, é, é, quer dizer, tem uma variação menor, mas ainda é mais cara né, do, que, do que gás natural, que é a reforma. Pode passar. 
Mas se a gente vê as projeções, considerando ainda o custo projetado do carbono, então a tendência é que vai crescer o, as, é, o, hidrogênio, o custo do hidrogênio a partir de fósseis. Por outro lado, vai cair o custo de produção do, do hidrogênio renovável. Então, lá para 2035, 40 já começa a ficar mais competitivo, segundo essas projeções. Né? Bom, potencial, isso aqui é o que a gente calculou, coloquei o sol aqui, porque é aí que tudo acontece, né? é uma bola de hidrogênio, e, e as renováveis são praticamente solares, né? então vem todo do... Bom, potencial técnico, a gente calculou aqui no 2031, então a gente já foi também é, recortando, né? pode ir, então, o que a gente fez? Tem um inventário de recursos energéticos para o longo prazo, para 2050. Tem a demanda final de energéticos para 2050. Então, a gente pegou o saldo, o que sobrou, entre aspas, né, projetado. E daí a gente calculou a geração não só de, de eletrólise, mas também de fósseis. Bom, o resultado dessa essa é uma estimativa é, preliminar. Tem estudos mais aprofundados ainda que estão sendo feitos mas é, o potencial é de 1,8 gigatonelada de hidrogênio ao ano. Se a gente pegar a demanda mundial é, de 2018, daria 20 vezes para atender essa demanda. Então, potencial bastante grande é de produção. Isso ainda é estimativas conservadoras. Né? Pode passar? Então, a gente vê também que a offshore ela, ela se destaca aqui. Então, a maior parte é offshore, até porque a gente descontou então, tem o um critério de adicionalidade, ou seja, uma energia nova, além da, das é, demandas projetadas de energia elétrica. Então, offshore, como ainda tem um, é, um mar inteiro aí para ser explorado, é um grande potencial. Pode passar. Novamente, só para ter exemplo, né, assim, do, vocês aqui já devem ter visto esse... A gente tem um dashboard também, que, e os trabalhos do Ibama também. É, a gente fez esse potencial de 700 GB que está no, é, no roadmap. E aqui são os projetos já do, que já estão sendo licenciados do Ibama. A gente vê que no litoral do Nordeste, bastante ocupado já, tem até algumas sobreposições. Aqui no Rio de Janeiro também. Pode passar. O solar é um pouquinho mais democrático. O solar está também espalhado aí pelo Brasil. Pode passar. Biomassa residual, só, só para pegar essas três renováveis aqui. Também aqui fica mais para o centro-sul. Então, se a gente pensar em outras aplicações, além da energia, como fertilizantes, ela, elas estão muito próximas também da demanda. É, a infraestrutura de petróleo e de portos já pode ser um diferencial também. Então, se a gente pegar, a gente vai ver mais para frente os projetos aqui. Muitos já estão em, em portos, em PC, em Açu. E aqui já são os projetos. A gente tem projeto de eletronuclear. Pode, pode, valeu, Mojim. É da Itaipu Binacional, tem um PDI, que eles estão contribuindo também para o roadmap. É Furnas, é a Shell com Raizen, no Porto de Açu também. É Unigel, em Camaçari. Enterprise Energy no Rio Grande do Norte, Neo Energia no Ceará. Pode ir. Isso aqui está público, depois vocês. É, e está no dashboard, daí vocês podem aprofundar aqui é, com os números. Né? Fort Skill no, no Porto é, de Açu. Energix em PC. Em PC tá, tem hub de hidrogênio verde, tem algumas, alguns incentivos lá, tem uma ZPE, que é a zona pra, pra, que favorece a exportação também. A Query em P100, White Martins, também no Ceará, a EDP já tem, já tem molécula né, é, é, sendo produzida, então não é só projeto, mas tem muita, muita coisa só anunciada, mas já tem mo molécula é, no mercado. A Query no, em Swap, Neo né, Energia em Pernambuco também assinaram um memorando de entendimento. Pode passar. Esse projeto da, da Shell e da Raiz também é bastante interessante que tem um, um reformador de etanol, que é para a utilização dos ônibus do campus da USP. É, o, o etanol ele é um carregador né, do hidrogênio, então é outra maneira 
de é, de estar tá transportando, que um, um dos desafios é o transporte do hidrogênio, né? Pela densidade é, da, volumétrica da, da molécula. Então, pode ser uma alternativa também. Pode passar. É, outros projetos também, tem a Neo Energia, né, no Rio Grande do Norte, até a Petrobras agora, com o nosso professor Thomas Kim também, já tem uma, uma gerência relacionada ao offshore e outras é, renováveis para a transição energética. Ele falou que ali é um ponto interessante. É, White Martins, o governo de Minas Gerais já tem projetos também, Rio Grande do Norte também para offshore, eu comento agora, pode passar. E algumas considerações é, finais? Pode ir. Bom, assim, o Brasil ele pode ser um, um player importante pela quantidade de renováveis que a gente tem, renováveis é, abundantes. Algumas, talvez as frutas mais baixas, sejam é, etanol ou combustíveis também. Mas temos bastante oportunidades, principalmente metalurgia. Metalurgia, assim, em autofornos, o pessoal é, assim, tem algumas estimativas, mas para cada tonelada de aço são emitidas duas toneladas e meia de... de é, de óxido de carbono, bastante grande, né? Assim, o, é, a oportunidade de descarbonização. Por outro lado, a DRI, se utilizar hidrogênio renovável, ela chega a zero. Se usar gás natural é, para reduzir o ferro, fica um pouquinho abaixo né, da, é, esse de 2,4, fica em torno de 1,5, um uma tonelada e meia por tonelada de aço produzido. E se for de hidrogênio verde, vai para zero. Só que tem, aquele, assim, tem desafios também, né? não é tão, tão simples, até porque tem um, um custo afundado já é, dos autofornos, que já tem uma expectativa de, de vida. Então ainda não vai ser para agora, é para né, médio, longo prazo, mas é uma oportunidade boa. Para fertilizantes, a gente já estava comentando aqui antes no, de começar as palestras, a gente importa... A amônia também vem, do, vem da Europa, da Rússia principalmente, e daí a gente vai exportar, assim, tem coisas que é, não fazem muito sentido, né? a gente importa e depois vai exportar agora hidrogênio verde. Não, a gente pode usar amônia para fertilizantes, o Brasil é um dos maiores produtores de, de alimento do mundo, a gente tem uma necessidade grande de, de fertilizantes, então é uma outra opção para utilização e ganho de escala também, ganho de escala na produção de amônia. Se tiver exportação e for competitivo, por que não também? Pode passar? Só mais um. Bom, e o recado, é, acho que, é, que fica aqui, é, é o foco no hidrogênio de baixo carbono. A gente mostrei algumas rotas de produção, é, assim, ah, do hidrogênio verde, azul, mas a gente foca em hidrogênio de baixo carbono. A gente entende que o Brasil ele tem várias oportunidades Pode ser da vinhaça de cana, pode ser de resíduos é, é, agrícolas, tratamento de esgoto. Então, tem várias rotas de obtenção de hidrogênio, até de fósseis, por que não? Desde que né, tem a captura de carbono. É, por eletrólise é uma via importante, mas a gente não quer ter o trancamento tecnológico. É importante que não tenha o trancamento tecnológico de nenhuma rota e que seja aproveitada todas as oportunidades para o Brasil. Então, é, foco no baixo carbono é o entendimento que a gente vê assim, mais adequado, né? considerando a abundância de recursos que o Brasil tem, renováveis e não renováveis. Vai passar? E aqui algumas é, as referências. E a gente tem também essas publicações interativas. Vocês podem, assim, esses números que eu coloquei estão públicos de maneira também interativa. É isso aí. Obrigado, pessoal. Vamos juntos. Rodrigo, a apresentação é muito interessante. Informações. Impressive work that EPE is doing about the about this the strategy. And I think you said that the roadmap for hydrogen is being prepared for the for yeah, yeah. near future. Okay. Okay. Any questions, professor? Thank you very much. Uh, one question and one comment. The question, one slide you show the efficiency of producing hydrogen. 
And for example, the case of Helotrodis, you said that the efficiency was 70%. What kind of efficiency is this? Because we know that we need, let's say, three to four times more electricity than the energy content of hydrogen itself. So almost by definition, the energy balance is negative. So you can never have an efficiency of 70%. I think 70% is the efficiency of, let's say, splitting the, mo let's say, the molecule into oxygen and hydrogen. But the energy of the hydrogen itself is one third or one fourth, one fifth. So the, the balance is, in fact, is negative. So just, I think this information has been presented very carefully because it, it puts a completely wrong message that it does make energy sense to produce hydrogen. It does not make. It, the balance is negative. And then my comment, uh, in many places, hydrogen is being considered not as an energy source, but as an, an energy carrier to be used for storage, for example. But in the case of Brazil, it's completely crazy, let's say, to produce, let's say, wind or solar to produce hydrogen because we already have a battery. I don't know if you know, Stefan, 70% uh, of all electricity really comes from hydro. So the battery is already there. So when you look into the future of the power system in Brazil, what you see, an overproduction or overinstallation of solar and wind, precisely because of the intermittence of solar and wind, in the case of Brazil, can be balanced by the battery that you already have. So in the case of Brazil, it doesn't make sense to make hydrogen. If you were to have wind, uh, let's say offshore wind, uh, we should produce electricity. And what's left? we should store in the form of water in our reservoir, never in, the, in terms of hydrogen. That's why hydrogen, and you, you mentioned that in the end, only makes sense in Brazil for non-energy uses. Brazil is a major importer of ammonia. So, okay, of course, in that case, you have to produce hydrogen to produce ammonia, but not in the energy care. Brazil has a tradition of exporting uh, soya beans and then import shoyu. Brazil is a large exporter of cocoa beans, and Germany is, and Belgium is the large exporter of chocolate. So it's crazy to export hydrogen. You should export, if you were to produce hydrogen for, let's say, for production of specific goods, you should produce the good in Brazil and then sell that good at, at a higher price. That justifies that it has a carbon footprint close to zero negative, but never export the raw material. No, no developed country export raw materials. The US, Europe does not export raw materials. They export finished goods. And we have a tradition in Brazil to export crude oil, cocoa beans, co uh, uh, soy flour. This is crazy, Brazil. <laughs> so what's the purpose of that? So I, I really don't understand why, let's say, uh, EPE or energy company in Brazil, I think about a crazy thing that does not make sense. In the case of EPE, the PNE PNE 2050 is uh, the long-term planning of the Brazilian ships is done without any energy modeling. There is no integrated model in the energy system of Brazil. These are just even Irina that you mentioned. Irina hired our group last year to do the job that they don't know how to do because they don't have integrated models. These are in fact this is simply a project. They're using Excel files. Say, okay, this is gonna grow. 3% per year, five. when Brazil, when the PE 2050 says, okay, we're gonna have 30% electric vehicles in 2050, this is wishful thinking. This, they're fixing 30% electric vehicles. This is not a result of anything, so what's the economics be behind those scenarios? I don't see that. Thank you. It's not directory, just this craziness of doing planning without the proper tool for planning. Obrigado pelas considerações, professor. É, bom, os números, né, assim, em termos de eficiência, é, assim, o número que está na literatura assim, é 45 megawatt hora para produzir é, uma tonelada, né, ou quilo, 45 kWh hora para produzir um quilo. E um quilo gera 33 kWh hora de energia elétrica. Então, assim, o balanço de energia elétrica, de fato, né, é. Mas, assim, se você é, considerar que Está vertendo, assim, o mar está aí, assim... Não, não, tem, tem vento ali. Assim, mas estou falando que está ventando. Estou falando está ventando lá. Está ventando em, né, em alto mar, está ventando agora mesmo, assim, o Guga. 
Então, tem outros, como eu estava comentando, assim, para energia elétrica, para armazenamento de energia elétrica, de fato, tem outras maneiras, assim, principalmente aqui no Brasil. A gente tem é, hidrelétrica com reservatório, pode até ter tem reversíveis, que não tem, no, não tem comercialmente no Brasil, mas também é uma possibilidade, que é, faz ter uma eficiência melhor do que para é, conversão de hidrogênio. Mas dá para ser usado em outras áreas, em outros... É, para o setor energético, para energia elétrica, não, mas para os transportes pesados, talvez. Porque, assim... Mas e para a bateria? É. É. Então, mas para essas outras aplicações, como fertilizantes, como comentei, para metalurgia, para outros, é, é. E o mundo, assim, mas é, assim, a gente não está, por isso que assim, a EPE e, e a maioria dos estudos apontam assim, para não ter assim, também subsídio nenhum para isso. Pelo menos assim tem que ser feito algumas tem que ser feito conta, né? para ver se vale a pena entre o que você vai colocar e o que você vai ter de benefício, mas por isso que a gente não quer nenhum trancamento de rota. A gente falou assim, se, se, as pessoas, se os empreendedores querem investir no Brasil, a gente não vai impedir, assim, a gente vai criar regulações. É, é interessante que se, assim, as regras do jogo sejam claras e quem quiser investir está é, aberto. A gente não vai incentivar nenhuma rota, nenhuma, nenhum uso, nenhuma rota específica. Mas o mundo ele tá, ele, ele tem esse momento, ele tá, é, tem um interesse nessa molécula. Os Estados Unidos têm subsídios, é, Chile tem subsídio, Alemanha, enfim. Então, a abordagem é essa. Assim, neutralidade tecnológica, não concordo. Né, assim, Para armazenamento do setor elétrico, talvez não seja interessante, pelo menos num curto prazo, no curto médio prazo. Mas a gente quer deixar o ambiente, o ambiente aberto para as aplicações que venham a surgir. A gente não quer bloquear né, os, os players de mercado e, e aproveitar a estrutura que a gente tem. De fato, portos pode ser interessante para algumas instalações, retroáreas, né, em, em PC, aqui é, no Açu, Porto Central também está... É, enfim, são perspectivas que se abrem. É a energia, a energia, a energia é o eletrolizador ganhando escala também. É hoje assim, é importante o que você comentou assim sobre eletrolizadores. Hoje tem fila para comprar eletrolizador, assim, não tem, você vai na prateleira você não, não consegue comprar, assim, tem uma fila de espera. Mas é, é, o, é o custo de energia, o custo de energia que é o, o custo de energia é 70% do do custo de hidrogênio. É o custo da energia, é, mas do eletrolizador. Outra coisa importante também, assim, é, se a gente considerar off-grid, assim, totalmente é, um painel solar com eletrolizador, daí vai ficar mais, tende a ficar mais caro. O eletrolizador ele é caro, ele é um componente importante no CAPEX, e se ele ficar subutilizado, vai ficar mais caro, logicamente. Então é interessante que ele funcione quase que né, flat, fator de capacidade máximo para você conseguir. E daí é interessante usar a rede, usar a energia da rede, que daí é uma energia, você vai conseguir manter o, é, a produção otimizada. Daí, combinando um off-grid com energia da rede, tende a cair também o preço. Obrigado, Ok, we are like 10 minutes behind our original program so we need to run i would like to invite paula the next speaker paula is civil engineer and just finished her phd at ita her research focuses on energy system systems modeling and part of this are focused on offshore wind energy paula
So, hi everyone, I'm Paula. I just finished my PhD at ETA and my research focuses on the full energy system for Brazil, but in this study I focus on uh, offshore wind energy and I will explain uh, later why. And this is a published study in energy conversion and man management and the title is Enhancing Drought Resilience and Energy Security Through Complement Hydro by Offshore Wind Power. Um, okay, so we already know that we have the global problem of climate change and we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And talk specifically about the power system, ideally we need to repair uh, we can go <laughs> thermal power stations based on fossil fuels and invest more in renewable energy such as wind or solar energy. And before it was relatively easy because with fossil fuels, we can control the dispatch, the power dispatch, but with variable renewable energy, we can do that. Although we can learn some uh, weather patterns, it's quite hard to predict exactly how much power is gonna be gen generated from our system. Uh, so the question is how to organize our system in order to uh, balance that and answer questions where this wind and solar farms should be installed, uh, the capacity and the cost of our system. And we already know that we have an existing renewable system, mainly based on hydropower plants. And we also have an interconnected system, so we can generate power in Itaipu and that power can go to Sao Paulo. So the system is entirely interconnected. And Brazil has experience with this variability and operation, which can be quite complex. Um, but that also means that we have an already fluctuating system. So adding more renewable energy to our system and considering that the demand is also variable, it's quite complicated, it's a challenge. And we also need to avoid curtailment or energy waste when we have um, an exceeding power production that's not interesting to our system. And at the same time, we need to have a reliable power system to ensure energy security. So how to propose sustainable alternatives? You can go. Considering that uh, the demand is variable, so we need to consider time series. Uh, renewable energy, we also need to consider time series for that, for the potential. Uh, considering storage system and uh, there are batteries, but in our case, as uh, Roberto Schaeffer <laughs> also mentioned, we have uh, reservoirs, which are known as on, uh, the Brazilian batteries, considering technical parameters. And this method should be also spatially explicit to answer questions like where these parks should be installed. You can go. And for that, we use, we use computational methods based on mathematical op optimization and uh, combined with the data extensive approach and that's called energy system modeling. And I use Calip and Stefan is one of the creators of Calip, he and his group. It's an open source tool built in Python and I chose Calip because it's quite flexible so we can address many issues with Calip. And Calip is also designed for highly renewable systems so we can add this time series and all these technical parameters to Calip. And for that, I, uh, I also use a solver called uh, Gurabi. And the question is why I decided to study offshore wind separate, separately. And the first reason for that is because there are some technical features uh, that we don't have in onshore technologies, such as water depth and distance to shore. And we could have the case that um, farther the wind farm is we have higher wind speeds, but at the same time, we could have deeper water, at least for the Brazilian case. And so we have a trade-off here because for deep water, we need floating structures, which are more expensive compared to the gravity-based one, like monopile and jacket. Uh, and when I was writing this paper, Brazil was facing with the most uh, worst uh, drought in 91 years. And when we have low water availability, we need firm power based here in Brazil, we use mainly natural gas and that could increase the emissions from our sector. Mm -hmm. 
So the research questions are how complementary of shore wind and power are, uh, where should the wind parks be located, what are the operational changes in the current system, and I forgot to mention that to solve these optimization uh, problems, it can be very expensive computationally speaking. So that was my strategy. First, I solved the I I found the optimal locations of offshore wind farm, and then I used these results to the my full model to reduce to simplify the full model. So, yeah, and. Yeah, talk specifically about the offshore study. I first simulated uh, wind power potential. I used reanalysis data from ERA2, but I won't focus on that part of BIOS correction because I don't have much time. And then I analyzed the complementarity between hydro and offshore wind power. And then I created the power system model, um, but only considering offshore wind expansion. You can go. You can go. Uh, so, I simulated uh, wind power for 350 nodes using reanalysis data for 20 years at an hourly resolution. And I also considered some spatial constraints like water depth lower than 1,000 meters and distance to shore between 8 to 200 kilometers. And I also excluded migratory birds and uh, bird and protected areas. And for hydropower, I used a data called natural affluent energy provided by the national operator, ONES, and also for 20 years. And this is not uh, how much hydropower was generated, but how much hydropower was available at that time. So there is a difference you can do. And yeah, and then I applied the bias correction factor that I found, but I didn't mention here to Offshore nodes with capacity factor higher than 45%. You can go. And to analyze the complementarity analysis, I use Candle's correlation, which varies uh, from one to minus one. So if you have a correlation equals to zero, means that there is no correlation between our wind and hydro data. If it's a, a Perfect positive correlation means that our data are synchronous, so they have uh, the same shape. And the perfect negative correlation means that our data are complementary to, to each other. So that's the ideal case for the power system. Uh, so if it's closer to minus one, it's better. It, the higher the complementarity. And this is for the basins in the south of Brazil. And we can see that the, so ideally we need to have uh, blue squares and we can see that the complementarity, uh, it's not that high it, or it doesn't exist. But that's different for the other bases in Brazil. So we, you, we actually have a good complementarity, especially with wind in the northeast of Brazil and other basins. And for the Amazon basin, we don't have a good complementarity either, which is not good because in the Amazon basin is where we have the highest number of runoff rivers. But for all other bases, we have a positive context. And then I created the, the, the model, considering some scenarios. And I consider five scenarios. So the first one is the baseline, so no changes. And then I reduce the capex of offshore wind farms uh, by 10, 30, 50, and 70%. And then I consider two levels for natural gas price. And then I com combined the high price for natural gas and the capex redu reduction. And then in the last scenario, I completely banned fossil fuels. And you can go. And you can go. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I consider 20 years of data and then three cases of bias correction factor. So in total, we have 720 scenarios. And for that, uh, I spent one year in Delft and I use uh, their, it's a super computer called Delft Blue because in that case, we have a large problem and sometimes it's not possible to run this model in our own personal computers and we can go. And this is the first result. We can go twice because there are some animations. Uh, no, no, 
Yeah, yeah. Pode botão. Yeah. Uh, so, naturally, when we reduce the uh, capex of offshore wind, we have more offshore wind farms in our system. And for that case, uh, when we have high price for natural gas, offshore wind also appears, but it's important to mention here that I didn't consider the expansion of any other resource. So, uh, and I, I will talk more about this later. Uh, and yeah, and when like uh, banned fossil fuels, it was the only case that hydrogen appears to produce power. So it's, it was not part of the system. I forced that and that, that appeared. We can go. And these are the optimal locations when I reduce the capex by 70%. So in the northeast, southeast, and in the south. Uh, considering different types of foundation and distance to shore. And yeah, basically that. And this is something interesting. I don't know, the color is a bit weird in, in that presentation, but I hope you can understand. In red, we have the natural gas, and we can see that during the dry season or winter, we have an increase of natural gas. But when we add more offshore wind in our system, uh, wind in Brazil uh, has the, a greater uh, potential during the winter, during the dry season. So when we add that to our system, we can increase the natural gas or the uh, thermal power-based dispatch. And in the more advanced scenarios, we actually don't need natural gas at all in the dry season, but we are still needing that in the uh, rainy season. So the dynamic, uh, the dispatch will also change. You can go. And that affects also the storage, the reservoirs. This is the storage hydropower. And this blue line and purple line uh, are the more advanced scenarios or scenarios that we have uh, offshore wind farms. And because we are using, we are needing more power during the rainy season in that case, we cannot store that much hydropower during, during um, the winter, right? Uh, but we can store the precipitation that we have in the winter. So that's why we also have higher levels of storage hydropower in the, in the, yeah, in the summer, in the rainy season. You can go. Yeah, and this is the, the final result, uh, which is related to the emissions. So adding offshore wind farms could reduce emissions by 97% of emissions from the power sector. Uh, but of course, the more advanced scenarios. And I think that's it, if I can go. I oh, know, of course, conclusions. <laughs> uh, so we do have a high complementarity between the north northeastern wind regimes and most hydro basins. Natural gas is no longer essential in the dry season in systems with a high wind uh, share. And the combination of wind and hydro storage leads to a lower risk of empty reservoirs and we could eliminate 97% uh, of, of the power sector emissions. And that's it. And yeah, I, I mentioned before that I, I did the full model for Brazil, and offshore wind was not part of the optimal system because it's not cost competitive with uh, onshore wind. And yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Paulo, for, for the presentation. I had this opportunity to, to, to work a little bit with Paulo to actually publish that paper. Uh, was, it is really interesting work. Okay, have any question? Rodrigo, you have a question? Oi, Paulo. Obrigado aí pela apresentação. Boa, muito interessante. É, eu fiquei curioso assim naquela parte assim que não é muito estudada aqui no Brasil, né? Lá no do é, Roraima, aquela parte do, do Amapá ali, mas é mais para o norte acima da linha do Equador, né? É, apesar de ter um fator de capacidade mais baixo, ele não pode ter uma complementariedade assim entre 
porque o hemisfério norte, o regime de ventos é diferente, né? logicamente do sul aqui. É, você percebeu alguma vantagem competitiva, apesar de ter um fator de capacidade mais baixo, ele contribuir para uma, é, uma outra sazonalidade para o sistema? Uh, I will translate to you. He just asked me if uh, the wind in the north could have a complementarity with uh, or a benefit to our grid. And I think that there are better locations to deploy wind farms. So that's why it, it was not part of the optimal system because when we, we minimize the cost, so we want to have place where the potential is the highest Uh, but yeah, we, you could analyze different uh, technologies. I just did with uh, between hydro and power and uh, offshore wind. But perhaps it could be interesting if you analyze solar and other resource. But in that case, it was specifically for offshore and hydro, offshore wind and hydro. Another question. Congratulations, it's very interesting work. Uh, I would like about the, the, the optimization model, like the decision variables to reduce the, the costs. I would like to know about the optimization problem. Uh, like I would like about the decision variables that you use it to reduce the costs. Yeah, minimize the costs. So, yeah, the model, uh, in that case, the model minimizes the costs. So we add parameters like uh, capex, opex, uh, emissions, and everything. And you can either choose to minimize the emissions to have the lowest emissions possible and, or the minimal cost of our system. In that case, I only minimize the, the cost. OK. Muito obrigado, Paulo. Okay, uh, the last presentation, last speak is uh, Professor Sejain. He is the, a emeritus professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He works in the area of ocean structures and SOPSI engineering, and he's a coordinator of the Renewable uh, Energy Group in the at ocean. Also, he is a director general of the Brazilian National Institute of Oceanic Research, INPO. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning. We we are a little bit uh, late already. I try to be more objective in my presentation. I have a few slides to to discuss with you. Uh, I, I'm, I'd like just to mention the National Institute for Ocean Research. We are about to implement this institute. Professor Schaffer is part of our scientific committee. And uh, I, I think uh, all this area of ocean renewable, we would like very much to be uh, in collaboration with these uh, uh, new institutes. Uh, I'm talking not directly about uh, hydrogen, but I mentioned hydrogen also. But I'd like to talk about uh, uh, technology. Uh, our role here is to modify reality and to make uh, technology feasible. That's what we are trying to do with our group. Uh, please, the next one. This is uh, an event that uh, I participate. I, I, I've been the moderator of this event in the beginning of this year. Uh, it's a United Nations event that was in Rio de Janeiro, and there is some interesting questions that uh, we should ask to the presenters. And I would like to repeat here, in, in the context of uh, uh, technologies and application scenarios for renewable energy utilization. Uh, and the questions are uh, about which renewable sources should be further explored in your country region to achieve a robust lower carbon energy matrix. I think Professor Schaffer 
uh, respond and, and others too, uh, Professor Stefan and uh, Paula also focus on this, Rodrigo and, uh, and uh, I, I think Milad too. What are the main bottlenecks for implementing renewable energy plants in your country? This is uh, really a, a big issue here in Brazil, uh, special legal issues here. How, to, how do you predict the evolution of technologies and legal issues that could induce worldwide fast-track implementation of renewable energy generation? And uh, uh, also ask to mention possible hybrid plants for renewable sources. Uh, this, I think, it's uh, interesting. And uh, I think the audience could uh, think about this uh, because we don't have time to answer all these questions. But uh, I think it's interesting questions. OK. Uh, there is some points that uh, we, we agree in, in general terms, that is, renewable energy has great potential to contribute to UN Sustainable Development Goals. This was the focus of this conference uh, in the beginning of the, the year. Uh, climate change is accelerating the energy transition. Solving technical and legal bottlenecks will accelerate deployments. Ocean space planning, I think this is of paramount importance for offshore wind uh, will bring new investments to offshore renewables and a new market for uh, hydrogen production from renewable energy sources. I think uh, these are points that uh, I believe all we uh, agree. Okay. Uh, Milad mentioned this uh, slide. It's uh, uh, a slide that uh, we try to show what we are doing in terms of uh, ocean renewable energy or offshore renewable energy, doesn't matter. And uh, uh, in our case, uh, offshore wind, it's a uh, uh, relatively mature technology, but floating solar, it's something that we are studying nowadays as a possibility to work together. And uh, on the other side, uh, of course, wave, tidal, uh, tidal current and amplitude and thermal gradient, especially OTEC, has a great potential in Brazil. Uh, this is an example about how technology can reduce costs. I think this is uh, quite important in terms of uh, 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 wind farms. Uh, the possibility of uh, integrated analysis that could anticipate uh, problems related to maintenance and operation. Uh, I believe that the technology will play a very important role to uh, become uh, this technology more competitive in terms of offshore wind. And this is uh, a, 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 a a combination of a couple of analyses that take in consideration the, the, the wind profile and uh, the response from the turbines and the effect on the blades in terms of uh, a structural response, especially these uh, 15 megawatts turbine that has almost 100 meters, about 100 meters each blade, it means a very complex and flexible structure that uh, we should uh, look more carefully. Otherwise, problems of maintenance will increase a lot the cost of this uh, kind of structure. And uh, uh, this is a study that has been performed recently about hybrid wind and solar in, in certain regions of the country, especially in the northeast and uh, south uh, so southwest Brazil, and uh, we realized that uh, we have almost uh, forty percent of complementarity of solar in in relation to the total. If you manage to use the solar as uh, in 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 conjunction with uh, the wind offshore wind farms, and 
this is one reason that we are looking for solutions for floating soil. This is uh, part of my answer to the last question that was the pilot uh, hybrid park in, uh, in uh, especially using uh, ocean resources that uh, could combine wind, wave, solar, that's uh, what we are working nowadays, wind, wave, solar, but offshore a thermal gradient, OTEC, could be another technology to be added. We performed in the ocean tank and uh, about a uh, few, few years ago, some studies on floating platforms that uh, could be used for uh, OTEC and uh, uh, new technology must be involved to be more competitive because OTEC has a high capex and uh, it uh, makes the use nowadays uh, a little bit uh, expensive in, rela in relation to other possibilities. Uh, but uh, I think, as I mentioned before, there is a lot to be done. In terms of uh, floating wind or floating turbines, uh, specifically the construction of these and maintenance of these uh, floating structures, it's very, very important to become more competitive in terms of, oops, sorry, sorry. Now, anterior. Uh, when? No, on the next one. Yeah. No, then, no, before. Yeah. When you mention about these floating structures, there is two points very important. How you build the structure and uh, the, the cost of uh, moving, it's, it's very challenging. Uh, and materials can make the difference for this. Uh, we are trying to use a, a different kind of material that is a concrete with uh, polymeric fibers and trying to, to see if the construction could be more uh, effective compared with uh, steel. This is one point that we are uh, studying nowadays and try to compare different materials for the mooring. Uh, as uh, Milad mentioned, the decommissioning is uh, a, a key aspect that could